Um, like I said, my name is Jeff Carter. I'm the new director here at Hadavar. Bob brought me in a few months ago to um, take over as he was looking to retire, move up back up to Oregon. The challenge was that this is a ministry that he uh, founded and grew from the ground up. So every aspect of it really resonates with his heartbeat. So he was looking for someone who would be able to carry on that vision. Well, God led me to Hadavar to, to meet with Bob, and pretty much right from the start, uh, it was clear that we, we connected on a variety of levels. Um, it's difficult for, you know, among Bible teachers and theologians to find those with whom you agree on, you know, more than a few uh, issues. But with Bob, it was, it was just one issue after another that we really clicked on. And so it really seemed like a, a, a God thing. Um, a little, bit, uh, a little background about me, I've um, lived here in Irvine for most of my married life, uh, over 27 years. I have three kids and one wife, and uh, we have attended um, Mariner's Church for most of that time uh, over by UCI, and I was on staff there for several years running a program uh, that was very similar to what Hadavar does. It's called TruthWorks, and we were teaching people about the Bible, about their faith, and about how to take that next step in their spiritual journey. <clears throat> and we had, some, uh, we had some good success. People were really hungry for the word, and, and we saw that program you know, serve just thousands of people every year. So it was very, very gratifying. So when I met with Bob, I, I really found that this was something that God had really been preparing me for and um, you know, grooming me for a long time. So uh, I, I've also taught at most of the Christian universities in the area, so I, I really have a passion for helping people uh, grow in their faith. Now, something that you should know right up front about me is that I'm not really interested in knowledge for knowledge's sake or education for education's sake. The reason I teach the Bible is for what I like to call the, the so what. It's... Um, that we can take what we learn and do something about it. I'm interested in life change. So, um, you know, everyone is at a, a particular pa place in their spiritual journey, um, and everyone can grow closer to God and c closer to Christ's likeness um, in that journey. That's why I think God put me on the planet, is to uh, sh share truth about him and his word so we can take that next step in that journey. And that's what sanctification is all about. So if you come to hot of our classes, at any of our classes, and you learn a thousand new bits and pieces of information uh, that you didn't know before, and your life does not change, if your uh, walk with Christ is not closer, if you're not motivated to do something about what you've learned, then we have failed. Okay? And so I want you to keep me accountable. Um, if you come to a class and we don't talk about the so what, I want you to let me know. Um, another value that we're going to explore together is something that I call um, doing theology in community. Now, I'm going to need your, your help and participation in this. You're going to have to play along. Um, what this means is, you know, doing theology in community is, it means that I need you and you need me. And we all need each other. You have life experiences that I don't have, and you have different perspectives uh, you know, on things that I do. You have stories about how God has worked in your life that will bless my life. And, um, you know, that's what, it, that's what uh, you know, it, it, you, you also have different and sometimes opposing ideas about the Scripture. And that's okay. That's, that's what Scripture, that's what Proverbs means when it talks about iron sharpening iron. You know, when we grapple with things together, we're all benefited, okay? When we do theology in isolation, that's when problems come. Uh, that's when um, someone comes up with something new that usually turns out to be heresy. Uh, so we, we need to not only grapple with each other uh, regarding our ide ideas about God, but we also need to grapple with the faithful from all throughout history who have uh, contributed to that discussion. The best teachers are the ones who stand on the shoulders of the giants who have come before them. So with that said, we're going to interact quite a bit with each other. We're going to uh, take an idea and talk about it with those around us and then share together as a group. Okay, that's one thing that um, I actually got a lot of uh, feedback from folks is um, one, one thing that um, 
they would have enjoyed in, in Bob's class is to be able to uh, to discuss and talk about some of the you know just the wonderful and great uh, things that he he brought up in classes is, is uh, be able to talk talk about it with each other other than just at, at breaks and so we're going to be be able to do that now if if you're the more quiet type and and you don't really like to share and, and participate that's great you, there's no pressure for you to to do that you can sit quietly and listen but I hope as you get more comfortable that you will start to share because like I said. You know, we need each other. We need you. Um, so, what? Uh, back to what I was saying earlier about Bob. We have been so blessed to be able to sit under uh, Bob's teaching. He is uh, very unique and very gifted. And Bob has his own style. You know, every teacher is different. And I, I hope to bring to Hadavar a wide variety of very gifted, different teachers. So, I guess what I'm hoping for is, um, like all, what I'm saying is, I'm hoping for a measure of grace. It's a daunting task to uh, try to follow someone like Bob, and I actually do really feel that. I feel, um, uh, I appreciate the warm welcome that I feel here. So, anyway, thanks for putting up with me, and I, I hope we can get to get, get to know each other better as we figure out how to learn and grow alongside one another. All right, so why are we here? What are we trying to accomplish? in this study. What I wanted to do is, uh, in this, this fairly short window was to cover an area that um, was related to what Bob was teaching in the first regathering class. And like I mentioned before, really just to keep his seat warm um, until uh, we get video Bob back after the first of the year. Uh, Bob likes to take, uh, take the, the winter break starting in mid-November so we don't have to um, compete with Thanksgiving and Christmas. So we'll go for about four weeks and then come mid-November, we'll put things on pause and then pick, up, uh, pick it back up again with a virtual Bob after the first of the year. So we're going to be here, but this is not really Bob's class. We're just doing a little, um, you know, parenthesis until, until we, get, uh, we get video Bob back. And then we'll, we'll pick back up with the regular rhythm and um, maybe even have the same tables and all that kind of stuff and, and the, the Israel updates and, and all that kind of stuff. So... Um, we'll, we'll pick that back up when Bob is ready to go. What Bob uh, focused on quite a bit in, in his study in regards to covenants was the land covenant, what some people call the Palestinian covenant. We know, so we're not going to really touch on that one at all. Bob has done a just incredibly thorough job with that. So we're going to focus on the four covenants that really work together to help us understand the broad scope of salvation history and which... Uh, help us to see the one big unified plan of God more clearly. So that's our task. Uh, today is really just an introduction to the topic. We're going to focus on the reason and rationale for you know, why God makes covenants with man. Okay? So like I said, this, was, this is really an intro. So after the intro to the intro, here we go. So covenants in the plan of God. Campus Crusade has a slogan that you might have heard. God loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life. I like the basic message of that, but I would tweak it a little bit. I would say, there we go. God loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life. I would tweak that. I would say, God loves you and has a wonderful plan, and you can be a part of that plan. When you phrase it like that, the emphasis shifts away from my life and a more individualistic focus to the fact that God has all along had a plan, and the real question is, do I want to be part of that plan? The big thing that we need to get from that slogan is that it's not about you. Okay, We all go through life looking at life through our own unique eyes, uh, thinking of life in terms of how it affects me, what do I like and dislike, uh, what makes me happy, how can I get what I want out of life, and that's normal. Okay, but the, the, the reality that we face when we read the Bible is that it's not about us. It's about God. You know, history is, I know it's trite, but history is his story. Life is all about what God is doing in the world. Our challenge in growing in spiritual maturity is to get out of the self-centered mindset that we're born with and to start to view life with new eyes. So, back to the slogan, God loves you and has a wonderful plan. And you can be a part of that plan. The question is, do I really want to be part of that plan? Do I want to orient my life around the fact that God is working out his will in his way in the world? The amazing thing is that he invites us to be integral members of the outworking of that plan. 
Uh, but that takes a desire for change, change in priorities, change in perspective, change in investments of time and energy. But this is uh, why I believe we were created, to do our best to understand what God's plan is and then to do our best to involve ourselves in that plan. We need to follow the example of Isaiah who said, here am I, send me. So a couple of questions to think about and keep in the, in the back of our minds as we get started. Okay, what is God's plan? How does it affect me? And how can I arrange my life so as to participate most fully in that plan? I've given you some uh, room for notes just on the, on the, like the back side of the, the, the pages and stuff. There's a few fill-ins for the fill-in kind of folks. Um, so not, not a, a whole bunch of notes to go through. Um, so we are starting to think about and get into some of those so what kinds of questions. Okay? Like I mentioned earlier, it, it does no good to simply know more about God's plan if it has no effect on my life. So, what is God's plan? Now, some of this material may be new, and some of it may be you know, treading familiar ground. We're going to start by, did you want to put that back up? There we go. Uh, some of, uh, well, we're going to start by going over some foundational stuff first and then build on the foundation. Uh, where we're headed is that there's an overall picture that we're going to try to paint that um, it may take a few weeks to really get into focus. And so we have all the elements in place. So be patient and we'll, we'll get there. What I want to discuss today are the broad strokes of how God has revealed throughout history his plan uh, to redeem mankind back to himself. Uh, but hitting the highlights of the overarching plan of God in history but in, in hopes of tying it together in a way that you may not have seen before. I think we've all studied the covenants, at least in some respect, but it's how they interact together that help us understand the plan of God a little bit more clearly. Um, then, when we have a, a, a better grasp on that big picture, we can be in a better position to see where we fit into that picture. You know, far too often we hear um, isolated stories from the Bible and we sometimes have no idea how they relate to one another. At least that, that's the way I grew up in church. My father was a pastor, and I grew up in Sunday school and uh, knew all the stories, and, but I had no idea what the big picture was. I just knew, you know, David did this, and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego did this. And um, uh, I, I didn't know that each story was a part of one big unified plan that God had put into place and that I was connected to. So one of the... Um, one of the biggest areas of confusion for me was the question of how the Old Testament related with the New Testament. Uh, and how did Israel relate with the church? This, I truly believe, is one of, if not the most misunderstood questions in the church. And there are broad-ranging theological implications that, that flow from this. Other questions, um, growing up as a New Testament believer, what did all those laws in the Old Testament have to do with me and my life today I didn't understand you know and if they didn't apply to me then why were they in the Bible in the first place you know like I mentioned there's there's so much uh, confusion about this I was never taught about this and I, I grew up in a, in a pretty good you know Bible church other questions you know what does the promise promise of salvation look like in the Old Testament and how is it revealed it's pretty clear in the New Testament but not quite as clear in the Old Testament how do uh, the church and Israel relate to one another in the plan of God it's questions like these that we're going to grapple with together. All right. Structure helps us make sense of the whole. If you do a puzzle, you need two things. You need the box top to see the picture, and the next thing you do is start with the edges, typically, right? Once you have that structure, then you have a place to put all the bits and pieces of puzzle information you're trying to put together. Well, understanding the big picture helps all the little pieces make sense. It gives us a framework that provides context and structure to all the other information. So that's what we're doing today, is, is trying to describe a superstructure upon which we can hang all the little bits and pieces of information about God and the Bible that we have. Early on in class, um, Bob discussed the story about Abraham cutting animals in half and God passing through the severed animals alone. Kind of a strange story, but what's amazing is that it's from this story that we can anchor our salvation, 
our understanding of salvation through Messiah. Not just Jews, but Gentiles as well. Um, it's that event that is the anchor for, and foundation for God's promise of salvation even today. You know, who would have thought that such a strange, unique story would be so important to you and me today? There are so many stories in the Bible like this that are usually presented as separate, distinct events that are actually intimately related to one another. There, there are so many questions that we can answer by having a better understanding of the overall plan of God. When we understand the broad strokes of the plan of God, we can start to um, put all the pieces together, and we can begin to see much more clearly answers to many of the more perplexing questions in life. Questions like, why did God create us? What is the purpose of our lives? What's the purpose of suffering? And what's the basis for why we worship God? What indeed should be the most important things in life to us? And where uh, should our priorities lie? And, and, and so many more questions. So we're going to hit the, the highlights of how God has implemented his plan of salvation throughout history. And then hopefully this outline will help us understand more clearly the various movements and episodes in biblical history much more in context. All right, so like I promised, we're going to be breaking up in groups and discussing. So um, what we should probably do is maybe have the, uh, break up into groups of maybe four or five, uh, not, not much more than that, because I want people to have a chance to talk. And so maybe the front row can turn around and find groups of four or five, and then the third row turn around and make, make groups like that. We're gonna do this a few times tonight, so, so get, get used to this. And so the question we're gonna be talking about first is, Stepping back and looking at the, the biggest picture possible, think for a second, what would you say that the overall plan of God entails in succinct, short phrases? Okay, so let's start with that question, then I'll add another question um, as we go. All right? Go. So the way, the way I would phrase it would be to create a universe and creatures in it with whom he can fellowship and to whom he can reveal his glory knowing that we would reject him. So that's pre-fall. And then post-fall, it would, it would sort of play out a little uh, differently. And uh, post-fall also, you've got to understand, it's not a backup plan. Uh, God didn't think to himself, oh darn, they sin. we got to come up with a new plan. Okay, so post-fall. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> I hate to start that precedent. Bob always took down. Okay, I will. I will. I will print these out. I will print these out. Yes. So you don't have to try to feverishly write these down. Sure. No problem. So po post fall, I'd say to reconcile the world back to himself. A lot of you are saying that. To eradicate sin, and to enable us to enter into relationship with him. How has God revealed that plan to us? And this is really the purpose of this class because there's, there's no chapter in the Bible you know, on the plan of God. You know, Hezekiah 4.11 doesn't say, Thus spake the Lord, herein you will, you will find if thou truly seekest my most secret plans. You know, actually, could someone look up Hezekiah 4.11? Uh, we, we know oh, man. I thought, I, I thought I'd catch at least a couple of you. There's no Hezekiah in the Bible. <laughs> I think a few of you were thinking... Lamentations, Ezekiel, yeah. Daniel, <laughs> Hezekiah. But it sounds like a book, doesn't it? I almost said second. He I almost said second hesitations, but that doesn't sound like a Bible. So, um, so the purpose of uh, why we're here is to clarify that God has indeed laid out for what this plan looks like. Okay, and again, how has that happened? How has God revealed His plan to us? through the Bible, primarily in the form of covenants. And so I think that's the one thing I want to start with is helping us see that the covenants really are a roadmap for understanding the plan of God. They're not just promises God made with mankind. They were elements of his self-revelation and his intentions uh, for man. Uh, we need to see right up front that this, this reconciling the world back to himself ultimately involves what we call heaven, <clears throat> but is discussed in the Bible in terms of blessing. When uh, what, what God promises his people is blessing. Initially, 
um, that blessing is seen in, in, seen in terms of earthly blessing, living life to its fullest, being blessed with um, all life's essentials. But when this life and this age is over, it will result in heavenly blessing, which is our being able to spend eternity with God. But salvation is not just about heaven. It's about uh, life in the here and now. Uh, we need to see that the, the terminology in the Old Testament that's used for salvation is always couched around the term blessing. Okay? We've talked sort of about covenants. Let's actually talk about what a covenant is. I know this is probably treading some familiar ground, but examples, there's a lot of different kinds of examples of covenants in the Bible and in history in the ancient Near East. So different examples of a covenant could be a promise, could be a formal will or a business agreement, uh, territorial deeds. Uh, sometimes they look like national treaties. Uh, they're basically, uh, it's a formal agreement that defines relationships between uh, two parties. Another word for covenant is testament. When, when we make our last will and testament, it's uh, it basically an agreement between us and our friends and family as to how to dispose of our estate. When, we're turning, uh, when referring to the Bible, we, we, we use the terms Old and New Testament as a kind of shorthand for how God dealt with um, uh, mankind prior to the coming of Messiah and then how he now deals with man after Messiah. Uh, the problem with the, the terminology of Old and New Testament is that we can sometimes mistakenly infer that the Old Testament and God's dealing with Israel are old as in defunct or no longer applicable and the New Testament somehow replaces that old way of dealing. In other words, the church replaces Israel as the people of God and, and nothing could be further from the truth. What we end up doing in that case is devaluing the story of salvation uh, that led up to the cross and looking at our faith as simply a New Testament faith. And there are so many churches that are out there teaching that, and it's such a shame. Um, but the, the coming of Messiah, although it is the, the capstone and climax of the story of our salvation, is um, only one part of the story. What we're going to look at are the other parts of the story. Uh, and what we should end up with is, is a more holistic view of salvation history and how God has chosen to enter into agreements with mankind and how he's fulfilling those agreements. Uh, that, um, that's basically where the broad strokes of God's overall plan lie, in, in God making and keeping covenants with mankind. Now, um, you should have a separate handout behind your, um, your packet there. This is an appendix on the covenants, a little excerpt from uh, a book called How Firm a Foundation. I just want to read through this with you. Uh, Due to recent archaeological discoveries, there's been an explosion in our understanding of ancient Near Eastern covenants. Excavations uh, of the city of Mikoskoy uh, in Turkey have unearthed thousands of cuneiform tablets from the third millennium BC. These tablets contain many covenant documents, including a treaty between the Hittite king Hattusha and Pharaoh Ramses. The second. G. Herbert, uh, Herbert Livingston, a biblical historian, explains that the new knowledge about covenants current in the ancient Near East during the patriarchal and mosaic time span has aided our understanding of the scriptures. Scholars of all theological persuasions have admitted their debt to this new information, for it is not too strong to say that the religious faith and life of the Old Testament men and women cannot be understood apart from a careful study of the covenant relationship in the Old Testament. This wealth of information has il illuminated the relational world of the ancient Near East. Covenants could take many forms in the ancient world. Two friends might covenant together to always be faithful to each other. Marriage was a covenant binding a couple together before God. Moreover, a king might impose a covenant of loyalty on his subjects. Men related to each other by means of covenant, but more importantly, humankind related to God by covenant. The concept of covenant was foundational and integral to all of life in the ancient Near East. Therefore, the concept of covenant is critical to the understanding of the cultural and historical context of the scriptures. When God promised Abraham an heir, this is interesting, he simply believed and God reckoned it to him as righteousness. However, in the next verse, when God made a grant of land of Canaan to Abraham, he responded with a question. He said, O oh Lord, how may I know that I will possess it? So I, I don't know if you've ever thought about that. Why did he just believe in one circumstance, but when it came to land, he asked, how may I know? Um, 
God's response was to perform a well-known ritual, the covenant. In that culture, that this was the most solemn and binding of commitments. It was in the context of a covenant that God confirmed to Abraham that he could know for certain that God's promises were true. So that was, a, again, a well-known um, process that they had in that time. Yes? You are. And yet, if that's so true, because so many of the Reformed, very Calvinistic people, not because of John Calvin, but because of their own thinking, feel that Israel, you know, is dead in the New Testament, you know, that it's not the church and that kind of thing. Yeah, we're actually going to talk about that in just a little bit, about um, covenant theology and and how that really has nothing to do with what we're talking about. Right. It, this is the basis of dispensational theology. Yeah. Jeff, I need to graciously ask you for access to not only that slide, but yes. all other slides. I will print out the whole slide thing for next time. Okay. So you can have... Thank you for your commitment. Sure. Now, having your attention. <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to ask a question. Yes. In your slide here, first bullet appears to be what I call term and condition free. The second bullet appears to be term and condition rich. And In my understanding, a contract has terms and conditions not only to ensure the fulfillment of the contract, the penalty, but other terms and conditions to uh, be an escape clause, if you will, for not fulfilling the terms of the contract. However, in the case of the promise... I can only hold so much of my brain at once. <laughs> I love these questions because we're, we're absolutely going to hit that. There's, there's different kinds of, of covenants. There's a suzerain vassal treaty, and there's an unconditional grant covenant. That, inc that encompasses both of those that, that you're talking about. So we're absolutely going to hit those. But those are great questions. You guys are anticipating where we're going, so that's perfect. So. Yes. You Thank you. Have, in the beginning when you were doing your list, you said testament. Uh-huh. Which one does testament fit with? It, a, a, covenant, a testament is just another word for covenant. Oh, okay. Yeah. So in Old Testament and New Testament? Mm -hmm. some, some, yeah, sometimes people call it the Old Covenant and New Covenant. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Good. Um, they are they are Right. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. But we're we're definitely gonna gonna talk about the different kinds of covenants, the conditional and unconditional, as we as we move forward. Um. So, um, what I was saying was that um. Where was I? Let's see. Oh, I just read that uh, that article. There's another um. A scholar, Lambert Dolphin, he describes covenants like this. Uh, the Hebrew word uh, berit, covenant, occurs over 280 times in the Old Testament. Uh, the English word covenant means uh, a coming together. Uh, covenants can include treaties, alliances, agreements, compacts, pledges, mutual agreements, promises, and undertakings on behalf of another. Covenants in the Bible can be agreements between two individuals, between a king or leader and his people, or between God and individuals, or God and a group of individuals. Covenants be, can be conditional or unconditional. Conditional covenants are forfeited if one party violates or defaults on his part of the agreement. Unconditional covenants are arrangements in which the default of one party does not negate the ultimate fulfillment and blessings of the covenant. In our society, we make use of, of various types of covenants. Credit cards, automobile loans, mortgage agreements are all types of covenants. Uh, the lending party makes 
money or goods available to the borrower. The borrower agrees to pay back the loan usually with interest. Covenants of this kind are clearly conditional. So we're going to co go into that, uh, I think especially next week, the, the two different uh, main kinds of, the, of those covenants. So examples in the Bible of covenants between men, you've got um, Abraham in uh, Genesis 21 made a covenant with Abimelech. It says, when Abraham complained to Abimelech about a well of water, which Abimelech's servants had seized, Abimelech said, I do not know who's done this thing. You did not tell me, and I have not heard it until today. So Abraham took sheep and oxen, gave them to Abimelech, and the two men made a covenant. Um, in Joshua 24, Joshua makes a covenant with the people at Shechem as they're about to enter the land. So Joshua made a covenant with the people that day and made statutes and ordinances for them at Shechem. And Joshua wrote those words in the book of the law, and he took great, a great stone and set it up there under the oak in the sanctuary of the Lord. Uh, David and Jonathan, that's a pretty famous uh, covenant of friendship that they made in 1 Samuel 18, says when he had finished speaking to Saul, the soul, the, the soul of Jonathan was knit to the soul of David, and Jonathan loved him as his own soul. And Saul took him that day and would not let him return to his father's house. Then Jonathan made a covenant with David because he loved him as his own soul. And then there's also a covenant between Jacob and Laban in Genesis 31. He said, come now, let us make a covenant, you and I, and let it be a witness between you and me. So Jacob took a stone, set up a pillar, and Jacob said to his kinsmen, gather stones. And they took stones and made a heap, and they ate there by the heap. So God used this, this common form of agreement that was well known in the ancient Near East, uh, something with which Abraham would be very familiar to and he used it to establish a relationship with mankind. This was a, a solemn vow, a serious binding communicate, a commitment to communicate to humanity through Abraham what he wanted their relationship to look like. Okay? And that's where we're going with this. It's, 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 it's an establishing of a relationship. So let's start at the very beginning. The first time we see the term covenant used in the Bible is with regard to... Um, uh, Noah and the flood in Genesis 9. Um, Genesis 9, 11 through uh, 13. Uh, those of you who are still looking for the book of Hezekiah, you just flip back to the beginning. You can find <laughs> Genesis. Um, verse 11. I establish my covenant with you, and all flesh shall never again be cut off by water to the flood. Neither shall there again be a flood to destroy the earth. God said, this is the sign of the covenant which I am making between me and you and every living creature that is with you for all successive generations. I set my bow in the cloud, and it shall be a sign of the covenant between me and the earth. Now, there, there are some Bible teachers who teach that there are some implied covenants in the creation story. Uh, but we're going we're gonna to stick with the places where God actually calls them covenants. Um, and then at the end of our study, um, depending on how much time we have, we may go, go into explaining what covenant theology is. Uh, which, like I said, has nothing to do with what we're teaching. and um, It's the, basically the opposite of dispensational theology, and which is you know, the foundation of what we're talking about uh, here today. So, back to the flood. You'll notice that the context in which God establishes a covenant relationship with man after the flood is that a, a context of sin and judgment on sin. And that's important to see. Because God had created the earth and blessed it, but human rebellion had jeopardized that blessing to the point where God nearly wiped out the entire planet. Uh, in his grace, though, he relented and preserved a remnant that was faithful to him. And that's always God's uh, procedure. He always pr uh, preserves for himself a faithful remnant. So it's here that we see God promising that despite the continued sin by man, he would not indeed destroy them completely. Uh, here we see a bit of the revelation of the thinking of God toward man. And that's what we're trying to see is God's thinking as we go throughout history. Is uh, God is holy and will judge sin, but he is also merciful and will provide grace where he deems appropriate. And it's here we see the purpose of God establishing covenants with man. This is, uh, this is the important point. God's holy nature requires punishment for sin. Man's fallen nature ensures that he will continually fall into sin. Therefore, man will always be in danger of the wrath of God falling upon him. So God establishes 
covenants with man, this is kind of a summary of what, we've, what we're leading toward, is God establishes covenants with man, <laughs> promising him initially that uh, he would not destroy the earth in the same way again, and then later, through a series of covenants known as the redemptive covenants, promising man that an ultimate way of salvation from that ever-present sin would be provided. Okay, I'm going to say that one more time. God establishes covenants with man, promising him initially that he would not destroy the earth in the same way again, and then later, through a series of covenants known as the redemptive covenants, promising man that an ultimate way of salvation from that ever-present sin would be provided. Now, this is the important point to get a, a, a concept to get a grasp of before we move on. Why is God making covenants with man? He's taking the first steps. Again, we're thinking progressive revelation. We're thinking of what they were thinking as they went throughout history. They didn't have a lot of revelation about who God was or, or what he wanted. Adam had a little bit of revelation about uh, sacrifices, but we don't know what else he, he knew. Um, but, but God is taking the first steps in, um, in revealing this covenant to Abraham of establishing a relationship with mankind and setting out the parameters of that relationship. Going uh, back to one of the definitions of covenants is a formal agreement that defines relationships between two parties. Uh, we often talk about the details of the covenants, but it helps us to see the relationships of the covenants to the plan of God by examining the purpose of God in establishing uh, covenants with man. So again, the context in which God establishes relationships um, or a covenant relationship with man is that of sin and judgment on sin. This is the same thing. God's holy nature requires punishment for sin. Man's fallen nature ensures that he will continually fall into sin and man would always be in danger of the wrath of God falling upon him. So with these agreements from God, man would not always have to worry about God's just judgment falling upon him. Okay. Um, Man would not have to go through life wondering if God would at any moment justifiably zap him for his sin. You know, using the flood as an example, you know, after the flood, if God hadn't made the promise to Noah, what would they be thinking every time it rained? They'd be freaking out, thinking another flood's coming, he's destroying the world again, right? Um, but God made a covenant with mankind, putting the rainbow in the sky as the sign of that covenant, so that man would know that even though that they would indeed continue to sin and be, and be wicked, God would not destroy them in that way again. So the context in which God establishes a relationship with man is that of man's sin and God's judgment on that sin. In the face of continued sin and expectation of divine judgment, God establishes covenants with mankind so that man would know what to expect from God and would know God's expectations as well. It's basically a revealing of divine intentions. And that's the key point I, I kind of want to get to. So stepping back and getting the big picture perspective through the mechanism of covenants, God is establishing a relationship with man, revealing to man elements of his plan of dealing with man's sin. But this is just the first time that the uh, term covenant is used. And it's used here as somewhat of a preview of the four redemptive covenants that we're going to be spending the rest of our time uh, discussing. Um, these, um, like I said before, these are sometimes referred to as the redemptive covenants in that they progressively reveal um, God's plan for redeeming mankind. There's also, like I mentioned, the land covenant, sometimes called the Palestinian covenant, and we're not going to uh, cover on that one. Uh, that gives more details about the promise God made to Israel about their eternal claim to the land. Um, but to be clear, that these, these covenants are not redemptive in that somehow they mediate salvation. Uh, the way I'm using the term is to simply point out that they progressively reveal God's plan of redemption, which is promised in the Abrahamic covenant and then delivered in the new covenant. Okay, There are some, some bad theologies that actually uh, go off a different direction from that. So I want to clarify that. So these four redemptive covenants are the uh, Abrahamic covenant, the Mosaic covenant, the uh, Davidic covenant, and the new covenant. We're going to discuss these four in some detail and then describe how they work together. And that's going to be the big picture that we're seeking after. So now, digging deeper into the so what, let's break up into our groups again and Take a look at some more questions here. First question is, 
How can understanding the plan of God affect the way you live your life? In what activities should we involve ourselves in light of God's plan? What changes might we make to uh, orient our lives around God's priorities? All right, so go ahead and break up and talk about that for a few minutes. We'll come back together. Let's go ahead. We, I did leave you about two, two minutes over, so let's go ahead and, and uh, close out. I, I want to uh, tell you that I appreciate the fact that you are playing along, and I think this is great. I, I knew that you would. Bob has described how much of a family you guys have become over the years, and so um, I hope you enjoy the, the interaction, and uh, you guys are doing a great job. So let's go ahead and pray, and we'll, we'll jump into the details of the Abrahamic Covenant uh, next time. Lord, we thank you for your goodness. We thank you for your amazing plan that you have revealed to us. And please help us to, uh, to uh, have some good uh, beneficial takeaways from understanding uh, what that plan is and how to incorporate that uh, into our lives and arrange our lives around that. Uh, help us to walk away from uh, all of these, these classes um, having been changed, having been transformed a little bit more into your likeness. Help us to seek, to, to strive after that with, you know, every breath we take. Well, thank you for this time together. We love you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.